One of the challenges that we face in studying the Bible is remembering that when we read about the events that take place, about the people, about the words that they said, the things that they did, that we're remembering that these are real life individuals and that these are real life events. And trying to keep that in perspective when we read, rather than just reading words on a page, actually understanding that this really happened. That Jesus really was transfigured on the Mount of Transfiguration. That Jesus really did die on the cross for our sins. That he was scourged before he was placed on that cross. And that he was raised on the third day. Remembering that these are human beings with the same emotions that you and I have, with the same thoughts that you and I have, while difference in culture and technology, man hasn't changed in 2,000 years. Same feelings, same thoughts, same emotions. Now, sometimes we may not have much difficulty Looking at God's word as it relates to people like Peter, who was very human in his words and in his deeds and at times perhaps his flaws and hot-headedness. Some of us can relate to that. Some of us can relate to situations like Hannah and Esther and individuals we find in the New Testament. One of the reasons why we're going over in our character studies on Wednesday night is to try to, to kind of flesh out our understanding of some of these individuals that maybe don't regularly come up over the course of a normal study or a sermon. And so we look at these individuals and it reminds us that these are human beings. They weren't perfect. They were fallible human beings, just as we are. They had the same emotions, the same thoughts, same worries and, and cares as we do, same fears. But what about when it comes to Jesus, the, the one human being who has ever been and ever will be perfect? When we read about Jesus' life, is it a challenge for us to remember that, yes, he was God in the flesh, but he was also human? He was a human man. And he was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin, according to the Hebrew writer. That being the case, he had the same emotions that you and I have. He was subject to frustration. In fact, there are times that you can kind of hear his frustration when he would, uh, woe unto thee, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites kind of the exasperation that you can kind of read in his words when he addressed people. There are times when he showed his compassion, such as the widow woman whose son had died. He saw her and had compassion on her and told her, do not weep. And he raised her son. These examples remind us that Jesus was just as human as you and I, infallible human he was but still human and to remember and to put that into perspective this morning i'm going to talk a little bit about jesus's love for his mother mary's love for her son and our love first thought i want to consider with you is jesus's love for his mother there's not a lot of examples of Jesus and his mother having direct interaction. But what we do have does give us some insight, some glimpse into that relationship. Now, every son generally has a, a special relationship with his mother. That's mama. And picturing Jesus having a mother and, and having the same feelings I have for, towards my mom that Jesus had for his mother. I mean, she raised him, she nurtured him, took care of him. And Jesus, as of when he was 30 years old, she was still there. In fact, even after Jesus has died and raised in Acts chapter 1, she's still there. 
But what we do have regarding some of these events with Jesus and Mary do give us a little bit of insight, such as John chapter 2. In John chapter 2, starting in verse 1, we've had, we have what's known as the wedding at Cana. And starting in verse 1, on the third day there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee. And the mother of Jesus was there. Now both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. And when they ran out of wine, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And in verse 4, Jesus said to her, woman, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. Now, I don't believe this was disrespectful from Jesus. And, and by saying, woman, what does it's not like he was degrading her in any way. He's simply addressing this, why, what does that mean in terms of what you want me to do? My hour has not yet come, he said. Which is interesting because there seems to be an, implicit, an implied request from Mary to Jesus. They've run out of wine, and I know you can do something about that. To which Jesus replies, my hour has not yet come. He recognizes that Mary seems to be requesting something of a miraculous nature. Then after Jesus, we're not told of any more dialogue between Jesus and Mary, specifically here. But then in verse 5, his mother said to the servants, whatever he says to you, do it. Now, this probably speaks just as much of Jesus' love for his mother and consideration for his mother's requests as it does to Mary knowing her son. But Jesus doesn't say he'll do anything about it. In fact, if anything, he's implying I, I'm, my hour's not yet come and I shouldn't be doing that. I'm not going to be doing that right now. And yet Mary, knowing her son, she tells the servants, knowing that he's going to do something, whatever he tells you to do, do it. And of course, we see, starting in verse 6, that he does tell them what to do. And he turns water into wine. And the interesting thing about that is that Jesus makes a statement, this, does, this doesn't concern me, my hour's not yet come to reveal myself as Messiah and so forth, and yet he was willing to do this miracle for, because his mother made this request. And so he did. Now, does Jesus say anything about loving his mother here? No, he doesn't. But the event itself and the dialogue involved shows a very close and well understood relationship that the two of them had. She knew full well what he was capable of doing. She didn't even have to ask, knowing that he would do what needed to be done. And Jesus, despite his statement, knew that he was going to fulfill her request. And it's just a really interesting dynamic that you see here and that... I'm sure all of us have had either as mothers with our children or children with your mother or parent where there's an, kind of an understanding without even having to speak the words about what you are wanting from your child or what your parent is asking of you. But they don't have to actually say it. And that they know no matter how much you may say, well, I really, I really don't want to do that or I really shouldn't do that, that you're going to do it anyway. Because mom asked you. I think it's an interesting insight that we have into this. The other situation that perhaps shows this relationship even more is in John chapter 19. John chapter 19, starting at verse 25, Jesus is hanging on the cross. And Mary is there. She sees her son bleeding Remember, he was beaten and then he was scourged. He is bloody. He is dirty. There are nails in his hands and his feet. He is almost naked, perhaps with a loincloth on. The idea of humiliation. And Mary's having to watch all of this. And in verse 25, G, uh, uh, John records for us, There stood by the cross of Jesus his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. Verse 26, when Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing by, that would be John, he said to his, his mother, woman, behold your son. 
And in verse 27, he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her to his own home. Again, Jesus doesn't say, at least it's not recorded, of him saying the words, Mother, I love you. But what he says, he directs Mary to John, John to Mary. And Jesus, being the firstborn, being the one who is responsible for the care of his mother, because at this point, apparently, or at least presumably, Joseph is no longer around. Most think he has passed away at this point. Jesus is the one responsible for her. And so he, makes, he takes care to address her needs, but make sure she's taken care of. And John agrees that he will take care of her. And you see that love from Jesus. I'm, I'm sure the disciples would have taken care of Mary anyway. Was it strictly necessary for Jesus to do this? Well, culturally, maybe, to make sure that somebody has been designated to take care of her. But you see the love that he has for his mother, making sure that John, and he didn't, he didn't assign anyone else to that, not that John was necessarily special uh, somehow or favored over others, but he knew John would take care of her. He knew he could take care of her. Now, like I said, there's not a whole lot in the Gospels. Keep in mind, we don't have a whole lot of those teenage years. You know, we have when he was 12 years old and he went missing and he was at the temple in Jerusalem. But from, thir from 12 years old up to around 30, we don't have a lot of what probably would have been involved in that day-to-day -day dialogue and day-to-day -day events involving him and his mother. But what little we do have speaks to Jesus as a human being who loved his mother. And his mother was a good woman. She was blessed among women. Both the angel Gabriel made that statement as well as her cousin Elizabeth makes that statement. She was favored by God, according to Gabriel. What we find in Luke chapter 2, starting in verse 8, we find after Jesus is born, the angels appear to these shepherds, and they're saying in verse 10, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And the angel continues to, to give direction to the shepherds. And as we go into verse 16, the shepherds have made haste to come to Joseph and Mary. And they find uh, the babe, Jesus, lying in a manger. And in verse 17, when they had seen him, they made widely known the saying, which was told them concerning this child. And all those who heard it marveled at those things, which were told, by, told them by the shepherds. But Mary, verse 19 kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. Now, Luke is the only one who records this particular type of mindset or thought process from Mary. And this isn't the only place here in Luke chapter 2 that Luke mentions this type of a, of a thought process from Mary. We kind of get a glimpse into what she's considering. Here's her newborn baby lying in a manger... She's hearing about these words that were told to them by this angel. And of course, she received Gabriel talking to her as well. And so she's having to think about, what does this mean? What is all this going to be about? I'm sure she had some understanding and maybe some recognition of the prophecies. But in terms of what it all, how it was all going to work out, this is her baby. This is her child. And Mary pondered these things. She kept these things in her heart. Jump to verse 46 in Luke chapter 2. Jesus is now 12 years old. Uh, he's gone missing. Mary and Joseph go back to Jerusalem looking for him. And it was after three days of looking. Can you imagine how terrifying that was as a parent? After three days of looking, they found him in the temple, verse 46, sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. So when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said to him, son, why have you done this to us? Look, your father and I have sought you anxiously. Which, uh, you know, from an emotional perspective was probably 
uh, 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 low estimate of the anxiety I'm sure that they felt. Do you, uh, and then Jesus in verse 49 said to them, why did you seek me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? But they did not understand the statement which he spoke to them. Now, keep in mind, Mary is remembering the fact that she, Gabriel came and talked to her to begin with, telling her what was going to happen. She looked forward to that. And then you have the shepherds saying that that angel came to them and this is what they said. And now you have this situation. I must be about my father's business, which had nothing to do with carpentry or artisan, artisanry or anything else. In verse 51, he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject to them. But his mother kept all these things in her heart. Again, Luke is the only one that records this type of insight into Mary's mind and thought process. And twice here in Luke chapter 2, it's recorded that what she's heard and what she's seen, that she is pondering these things. She's dwelling on these things. She's keeping these things in her heart. Why? Is it just idle curiosity? No, it involves her son. It involves her child. Uh, just as much as, as curious as she may have been as to how all this was going to unfold, th whatever the plan of, the, of God was going to be, it involved her baby. And so this is something that as a mother, she wanted to think about. She wanted to dwell on. Then we go forward into John, or into uh, Luke chapter, go backward actually in the, in the chapter of Luke, to verse 26. As we know... In Luke chapter 2, on the, the eighth day, the child was to be circumcised. They brought him to Jerusalem. They offered up the sacrifices. And we have a man named Simeon who had been told that he would see, he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's anointed. And so in verse 27, he came by the Spirit into the temple. This is Luke chapter 2, verse 27. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he, Simeon, took him in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace, according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared before the faces of all peoples, a light to bring revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. In verse 33, Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, behold, this child is destined for the fall and rising of many in Israel and for a sign which will be spoken against that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. Simeon, remember, he's being moved by the Holy Spirit as he discusses these things, talks about what Jesus is going to accomplish. He says, the child is destined for the fall and rising of many in Israel and a sign which will be spoken against that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. Of course, we know the full extent of what Jesus is going to accomplish. The full extent of what Jesus' purpose was both in his life, living a perfect life, and also in his suffering and in his death and in his resurrection. But then notice this one little thing that Simeon includes in this statement. At the beginning of verse 35, he speaks directly to Mary. In fact, notice verse 34, Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother. He's speaking directly to Mary, not just Joseph, although Joseph's there. He's speaking directly to Mary. Why? Mary is the mom. She's the mother. She has these things in her heart. She's dwelling on these things. He says, this is what he's going to do. And then in verse 35, he says, yes, a sword will pierce through your own soul also. A sword will pierce through your own soul also. Was he talking about having to watch Jesus on the cross, dying, knowing that that would be the end result of the Messiah, that Jesus was going to have to die as per prophecy. 
but that he's telling Mary, even though Mary at this point probably had no idea what it meant. Yes, as he's speaking directly to Mary, a sword will pierce through your own soul also. Putting ourselves in that position, not just of Jesus towards his mother, because that's what we have to do when we read scriptures, put ourselves in their shoes and to imagine what their thoughts were, what their emotions were, what the reactions to things were like. Well, it's kind of hard to put ourselves in Jesus' shoes and it would be inappropriate perhaps in some ways for us to even try. But from a human perspective, we can at least understand what love he must have had for his mother. But certainly for those of us who are parents toward our child, and particularly for Mary, a mother, his mother, having to watch her child unjustly tried, unjustly beaten, unjustly having his back ripped off of him, unjustly nailed to a tree, and then put up in humiliation to die. Yes, a sword will pierce through your own soul also. But it was going to serve a purpose. It was going to fulfill the will of the Father. But imagine the emotion. Imagine her thoughts. Whether by the time Jesus is being crucified, she has an understanding of how this was going to work. I mean, even the apostles didn't fully understand it. They didn't fully understand the nature of the kingdom, the spiritual nature of it. Did Mary? We don't know. But what we do know is that as of Acts chapter 1, we see Jesus, or we see Mary and Jesus' brothers there with the apostles after Jesus has been raised from the dead. Now, having discussed Jesus, having discussed Mary, we could talk today about, and we have in Mother's Days past, about characteristics of mothers that we should emulate and about how, as parents, we should make sure that we're being proper examples for our children as our songs have helped to, to remind us. But what if we go beyond just the physical, familial relationship of parent and child? And make sure that we're maintaining the proper perspective that we need to have in this world. In Matthew chapter 10 and in verse 34, Jesus says, Do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. I didn't come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's enemies will be those of his own household. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. He who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. He who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose it, he who loses his life for my sake will find it. We want to ask ourselves three questions this morning. How much, first question, how much do we love Jesus? Because we can say all day long, I love Jesus, I love Jesus. And we have friends and people in our lives who will say that they love Jesus. But when the question comes down to, who do you love the most? Are you willing to follow Jesus? Are you willing to take up your cross? To take up all that that in, in, entails. The, the name of, Christ, of, the, of being a Christian. Taking up all the burdens that may come in terms of persecution. Taking up the cares of life. All of that. And instead focusing yourself on heaven. Am I prepared to love Jesus more than I love my mom and dad? Do I love Jesus more than my spouse? Do I love Jesus more than my children? You know, we read the words, but again, put it in real life thoughts. 
do I love Jesus more? Because Jesus goes so far as to say in Luke chapter 14 and in verse 25 or verse 26, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. What does Jesus mean by hate? Relative to how much they love Jesus. Not that we are to hate our parents or our family. But notice the contrast, that by contrast to how much I love Jesus, I am willing to forsake these individuals, especially if they're wanting me to do wicked things and, and be evil. Instead, I'm willing to serve Jesus. And I put Jesus first because I love Jesus more than I love the family, the relationships in my life. In John chapter 14 and in verse 15, Jesus says very simply, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. In verse 21 of John chapter 14, he who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he, will, and he who loves me will be loved by my father and I will love him and manifest myself to him. In verse 24 of John 14, he who does not love me does not keep my words. And the words which you hear are not mine, but the Father's who sent me. In John chapter 15 and in verse 9, As the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. Notice on whom he puts the responsibility of abiding in his love. It's not God's job to keep us abiding in his love. It's not Jesus' job. It's my responsibility. How do I abide in the love of Jesus? By keeping his commandments. Am I willing to keep the commandments of Jesus? Even if that means that the people in my life who perhaps are most important to me in this world may disown me. Am I, do I love Jesus so much and I want to follow and willing to obey his command so much that I'm willing to allow others to discontinue their relationship with me? Whether it's my parents, my children, because I want to do what God says. And they don't, they don't like that. And so they don't want anything to do with me anymore. Am I willing to give that up? Because I love Jesus. In Mark chapter 10. And in verse 28. This kind of flows right into. Am I willing to sacrifice. For the sake of the kingdom. Now in context of Matthew chapter. Uh, of Mark chapter 10 rather. He's talking to his apostles. And there is a, 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 a parallel recording of this in Matthew as well. But notice what, what Peter says and then how Jesus responds here in Mark chapter 10 and in verse 28. Peter began to say to him, see, we have left all or forsaken all and followed you. Verse 29. So Jesus answered and said, assuredly, I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake and the gospels. Who shall not receive a hundredfold now in this time. Houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions. And in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last first. Now what Peter says doesn't mean that they abandoned them. It's not that they abandoned their spouses. Peter didn't abandon his wife when he went to serve Jesus. But they did make sacrifices. They sacrificed their time. And ultimately, they sacrificed, like Peter, his life and the lives of his family, supposedly. All because of their faith in Christ Jesus. What are we willing to sacrifice? The apostles were willing to sacrifice everything. They were willing to give up whatever was necessary. Take whatever time that Jesus required of them away from their livelihoods, away from their families to do 
those things that were needed for the kingdom. And it ultimately cost all of them their lives, save for John, who died. He still, he still sacrificed as well, being in exile. They were all suffering persecution. How much do we love Jesus? Do we love Jesus so much that we're willing to sacrifice for the sake of the kingdom? Whose family do we most want to be part of? Our physical family, certainly, there's that natural love and care and concern for our physical families. Our physical parents, our children. But whose family is most important to us? Jesus says in Matthew chapter 12, and in verse 46, or we find in Matthew chapter 12, verse 46, that Jesus' mother, Mary, and his brothers were outside this place where they were, and they wanted to talk to him. And so some came, verse 47, they say, look, your mother and your brothers are standing outside, and they seek to speak with you. But Jesus says in verse 48, he answered and said, who is my mother, and who are my brothers? He stretched out his hand toward his disciples and said, Here are my mother and my brothers, for whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. Jesus wasn't saying he didn't care about his mom or his siblings. What he's saying is he cared more about the family of the Father, the family of God, which is most important to us. As our hymns have reminded us to train our children, to teach them the will of God, to thank God for Christian homes, for parents who are willing to teach us God's word or who have taught us God's word and making sure that those of us who are children in a household, that we understand what God's role for us is but recognizing that there is one thing more important than the physical blood that binds families. It's the spiritual blood of Christ that binds you and me together. All of us here are closer in reality than I am to my children, than I am to my wife or my parents. Because we are bound by blood of Christ. And all who are added to the body of Christ are his family. And they are God's family. Do you want to be a part of God's family this morning? For those of us who are not Christians, you can have that blood of Christ wash away your sin. And have God add you to the family of Christ. His body, which is the church. For those of us who are Christians, we should ask ourselves these three questions. And if we end up having to answer one of these questions in our current state right now, that is to say, how much do we love Jesus? Do I love Jesus enough that I put him first above my physical family? If the answer is no, I need to consider my state. Are you willing to sacrifice for the sake of the kingdom? If the answer is no, consider your state. You may be a member of the Lord's family, but that doesn't exempt us from judgment. Whatever your soul state is this morning, let us help you because we love you and we care about you. As you come forward and as we stand and sing.